recording, right? There we go. Now we're recording. December 27th? 27th? Yes, December 27th. Episode 298 and another solo rant. Not sure where I want to go with this one. I'm kind of leaning towards Project 8200. What is Project 8200? Today's your lucky fucking day. I'll post this video in the description in the top comment. Project 8200, and it's on the uh, channel called It's Redacted. Project 8200, not widely widely known about. Project 8200 was an effort within the U.S. Army's remote viewing unit to verify claims of subterranean extraterrestrials made by CIA analyst Pat Price in the 1970s. We obtained every 82 to 86 declassified file project, blah, 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 blah. In 2009, ex-Stargate head Skip Atwater, Skip Atwater declassified all of this information at an International Remote Viewing Association, IRVA, conference, though only hard copies of his presentation are available offline. What they show are the apparent confirmation by several other gifted remote viewers that a, quote, network of underground relays of underground bases exist across the world for the purpose of, quote, relaying something into space. As elite viewer Joseph McMonagall and Atwater discuss in those tapes, Project 8200 data suggests the locations relay information to a, quote, deep space, unquote, platform of unknown origin, sitting on a sort of tether to Earth, so it kind of sounds like geosynchronous orbit. It is not suggested in the file, but after review, we think it's reasonable to ask if a Lagrange point positioned in space Positions in space, the sun and the Earth's gravity create islands of stability. I think that's when it's between us and like the moon. There's a Lagrange point. I think there's probably Lagrange points between every body, but it's. I think it, I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong because I'm retarded. But I think it's sort of like a geosynchronous orbit for positions between bodies. Like it stays or geosynchronous. Like GPS stays at a certain point. Right, it's, I think it's always facing the Earth, kind of. It's almost like tidally locked, if you will. I think Lagrange point. I think a Lagrange point is like. It's it's at the same point between two bodies of yeah, like two celestial bodies. It like stays right there. I think that's where we're putting the next space station, LOP G L O P, dash G. Uh, it stands for L- lunar. I think lunar Orion project gateway or something it's supposed to the gateway to the moon the iss but we're just bumping it back a little more the deep space platform is described as ancient but with new technology both old and ultra modern other viewers describe the bases as a strange mix of natural and artificial formations it's a 15 minute and 21 second video i will post that and it was uploaded on April 11th, 2020. I've watched it or listened to it. I mean, probably, I don't know, 30 to 40 times. Just over months. I really like it because, first of all, the remote viewing program was CIA director at the time, Stansfield Turner, said that, so this wasn't just a fucking psycho. This was... This was a guy that the director of the CIA said was uh, was like top tier material. Said that he could see any point on Earth with his, with his remote viewing uh, capabilities. And goddamn, these sweatpants are tight. The fucking hol- that holiday hibernation feasting, I'm like a fucking glutton that I am. Um. Yeah, so he said that Stansfield Turner said that this guy Joseph McMonagall said that he could said that Joseph McMonagall could see anything on Earth at any time, and <clears throat> I think Hal Putoff, who was like the uh, who's like a forefather of like plasma physics, who I think worked at DARPA, I think maybe not maybe one of the major labs. He now works for Tom DeLong's company to the Stars Academy. 
but Hal put off the Nobel Prize, I think, candidate. I don't know. Maybe he might have won one or two, two. But he apparently gave over the project to Skip Atwater. I don't remember when. It was at um, it was at SEI, I think, whatever that stands for, SAIC. Um, he he gave he gave over the project to him and said something along the lines of like, I think like the paraphrased quote is like, "You might be interested in these underground alien bases." Yeah. And so what this thing is described as. What this thing is described as is that I am not banging on all cylinders today. It's described as this system of these underground bases on at least four points over the world. And I think they're under like four mountains on different continents. It's Mount Perdido. That's the one I always remember. Mount Hayes. I think that one's in Alaska. I don't know where Perdido is. It sounds like South America. In in when in when Ghani, it sounds like Africa. Perdido sounds like South America. In when Ghani sounds like South. Perdido sounds like South America. In when Ghani sounds like Africa. I know Mount Hayes is in Alaska. And I think there's one more somewhere in Asia. Mm-hmm. Um, but they say it's it's underneath these, there are these big alien bases. This this is, these are not my words. These are his. Or they are my words, but not my ideas. These are his. These big alien bases that are like very 2001 A Space Odyssey-ish. Like ultra advanced, but ancient. Which just means they're that much more advanced. Because it's these things that are under, that are old as shit, but are like light years ahead of anything we have. And what this guy, Joseph McMonagall, said is he said that they are not benevolent or malevolent. When he first saw them remote viewing, he thought that they were bad. He said it was the same feeling of like putting a snake in a box. Like the snake's in the box. It can't harm you. But he, but you know the snake's in the box. You put the box across the room. Like you can be tape, tape shut, but like. If you know there's a poisonous snake in there, like, you know. Um, But he said upon further remote viewing that he said there was no evil in it at all. There's no negativity. There's no positivity. It's just neutral. It's like, like a metronome or a buoy. It's just this thing recording or just kind of clicking, you know, like a bouncy ball that never loses energy, just do, do, like a windmill, whatever. There's no, it has no agenda. It's just, actually, those are all horrible examples. I think buoy is the only one that's a good example or analogy. It's just sending data. Now, now, where is that data going? Who's that going to? Maybe there's an, an, a nefarious thing with that, you know? If you just have a buoy out there, the buoy is not necessarily evil. But if you're using the buoy to see if, you know, if the buoy has a microphones on it and you're using the buoy to see if it picks up human voices because you don't want people fleeing your country on a, on a raft made of tires, shout out Cuba that could be nefarious but it's i don't really you know i guess that's a shitty argument though right because a gun is an evil to hold the gun side that's a fucking retarded argument it's a thing sending data and that's what joseph mcmonagall says says there's at least four of them and there's a deep space platform and uh, the lagrange point like you said just tethered just not just moving with the earth and it's beaming information to there, which I guess we're just, I guess we're just defaulting. We're just relying on Stanley Kubrick. It is then being beamed somewhere else, Saturn. My God, it's full of stars. But that's what it is. 
and upon one viewing he said that there were beings in there but it's sort of a skeleton crew it's like the guys watching over i don't know it's it's like it's like doing stadium security for an nfl team in the off season just like i don't know kind of patrol make sure there's no one but fucking a dead dog or something that's what he said it is he said that there are like beings there but it's just skeleton crew right almost like a missile silo missile years it's like yeah i mean technically these things are always poised and ready to launch but at the same time it's like berlin wall fell 30 years ago um yeah and that that that's a about the gist of it there's not much more information on it and i can't find any more on it but yeah he described it as a spider web he, he does think that there are sea floor locations or seabed locations i don't know if he saw them viewed them but he does think that they are there are seabed locations um yeah there are seabed locations there are at least four big ones under mountains but what is kind of weird is that this was in like the 70s which was like 18 so say 1970 which was like 18 or six i think 86 86 was uh japan airlines flight 1628 1528 jal um that flight in alaska that's like one of the more famous ufo sightings uh john callahan the third guy the third guy from the top at the uh faa he's the one that said that like they went and like presented it to reagan's like science advisory board and the cia showed up and said this meeting never happened but they were all excited because it had uh this was like the first time they had 30 minutes of like radar but this guy uh, in in yoki i i'm gonna butcher that um ching ching chong egg roll the pilot he was like apparently like a very good pilot like thousands of hours tens of thousands of hours of flight with no accidents 747 pilot just just respectable fucking employee he refused to uh rescind his statement about being uh they were kind of harassed by a ufo which i think they said was twice the size of an aircraft carrier which tends to be a common size with ufo sightings it's always one or two times the size of an aircraft carrier but um that that's the that's the flight where larry holcomb talks about it in his book presidents and ufos uh leslie kane talks about it in her book um ufos generals and government military officials um stephen greer talks about it and unacknowledged but it's it's where 1528 or 1628 i don't remember but it's jal like japanese alaskan airlines or maybe it's japanese alaskan J japanese airlines um but it's this that's where they were harassed by this ufo for like a half hour and it was doing like circles around them but it would get kind of close to them every once in a while and it the pilots could feel heat in the cockpit and again these are all the the japanese 747 captain's words not mine they could feel heat on their faces and he sketched it as this like acorn this like dark acorn type thing and it zipped around uh the the military got it on and again it's like well where's the evidence well apparently they took it also it's but again don't take my word for it and it was i believe it was a flight from japan bringing wine to north america and it was going to stop in alaska to refuel or something um and it was zipping around and shit but anyway that was uh that was a uh, fucking that was right near mount a's alaska or whatever whichever one's in alaska perdido in wangani i don't know that was right near, it was like within like 100 miles of it and apparently Joseph McMonagall said that like these like 
these underground bases. And again, none of this is like my wild speculation. This is, they may have speculated, but I'm just repeating them. They said, he said that like they operate, I guess they have like a, their own like magnetic field or some shit. I get McMonagall's words or Skip Atwater's words. I don't know. Um, within like a hundred miles of each location. And then sure enough, that's one of the things reported by the JAL pilot was that like shit was just kind of fucked up. So that's a little weird. Um. And not only that, so the another thing is he says that the they were linked together. Um, whether that's by like fiber optics or some other technology. Again, I'm I I am the king of like wildly speculating and not citing sources. I'm not doing that right now. These are all this guy's claims, the head of the remote viewing program or the head viewer of at the remote viewing program, Project Stargate, which is funded by the CIA to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. They use Joseph McMonagall to find Soviet subs and to um, and to like sketch the the mechanics or the the outline of like Chinese nuclear trigger device the trigger devices for Chinese nuclear weapons. Like this was this was at the top of like shit the CIA was doing in the Cold War. Like insane shit. <laughs> So it was a legit thing, and it was funded out the ass. And Joseph McMonagall still, where does he work? He works with the Monroe Institute, and I'm trying to get in touch with somebody. I can't get his, or I, I think I got his, he won't respond. Um, but he said that these things were sort of linked together. And then, like I said, all beaming to the deep space position. In my mind, that's kind of like the outline of like a satellite dish, right? You have like, the focal focus thing and you have the big dish collecting everything but it's the it's the four underground bases around the world beaming to one thing that, that's a big satellite right rest in peace Arecibo um, but yeah he said it was beaming out to there he thinks they're subterranean bases and he said when viewing it he said uh, I think his exact words or paraphrasing is um Time is a difficult thing, meaning he can't get a he can't get a read on it. Flipping back and forth between ancient, modern no sorry ancient, new and ultra modern. So like ancient Egypt to uh, like present day to bleeding edge SpaceX, and just flips its. So it's brand new, but it's physically ancient. Or it's technologically advanced, but physically ancient. So it'd be like if we found a quantum computer underneath the Great Pyramid. It would be ultra modern in that it is past what we have. I don't think Google's hit quantum supremacy yet. I think they have. Just scary. Fuck YouTube, by the way, for um, censoring shit. They are censoring Donald Trump's newest videos. I posted that yesterday, and a lot of people, well, they're not actually, no, they are. For the last 72, and now I think it's 96 hours, they've wiped he, they've wiped his newest videos off. I remember the one right before Christmas, that one was at 940,000 views, the last one I saw, The Plot to Steal America. They took that off. And there are a lot of people, good, that's hate speech. Dude, if you're fucking for that, they're coming for you next. There's no... You may think that they're on your side, and that's beneficial to them, but you are cattle just as I am. They're just taking me first, and then they're going to take you second. Anyway, I'm going to try to keep this one at Project 8200. Um, but no, fuck censorship. You can't fucking do that shit. It's Whether it's an episode with me, Ted I, and Dale, and Don the Pleb calling for an armed siege of DC or whether it's me and Roger Williams talking about the history of, of transistors and vacuum tubes. Once you, once you lay the foundation for censoring, it will slowly go to everything. How does it start? Alex Jones, easy target. 
this guy's this guy's saying that we're interdimensional aliens. He's saying Sandy Hook wasn't real. But once you can get your foot in the door, well, now that they're doing it to the U- United States, pre- they're doing it to the United States president. Like, dude. But at the same time, I do think that they're a private company. That's the that's the hypocritical kind of humble pie I got to eat. I think they're a private company. I think they're allowed to do that. It's just not good. But they're a private company. It's, you know, if I'm all for the free market, then the free market will then replace YouTube. I guess this is a put my money where my mouth is, which I am. I've uploaded the entire library of TPC to Rumble and to BitChute. I was going to put it at Vimeo, but they're trying to charge uh, 60 bucks a year for standard definition and 240 for no wait that because standard definition the whole library is like 240 gigabytes hd is like two terabytes so i'd have to do the 50 a month which i'm not trying yeah we're getting way off topic it's bad though i'm switching from gmail to proton mail i'm switching from youtube you don't want to hear this shit let's get back to aliens quantum supremacy it'd be like if we found a quantum computer underneath you know the great pyramids it would be ultra modern in that it is newer than anything we have but it'd be ancient in that you can't fucking censor dude what the fuck you can't there's no way this ends well there's project 8200 dope fucking maybe we'll swing back around to it but you can't, that's just not good. But you can, it's your private company. I, I mean, you know, is, is this just my own hypocrisy, right? Is it, I'm looking at others, I'm looking at those on the quote unquote left who are cheering for it because, you know, fuck Donald Trump, hate speech. And here I am saying, today it's Donald Trump. Yesterday it was Alex Jones, today it's Donald Trump. Tomorrow it's you. And they're going to label your shit as hate speech. And you're going to say, what do you mean? I was just offering a dissenting opinion within the Democratic Party. And they're going to say that's hate speech. And then you're going to start saying, guys, be careful. They came for me. They're coming for you next. You're going to say that to your more left, for your farther left friends. And they're going to look at you and say, oh, shut up. And then it's going to come for them. And then they're going to raise a flag in the further left until finally everyone's fucking dead. <sighs> Am I being hypocritical in that I'm saying you're only for it because it's against the guy you don't like, Donald Trump? Yet, let's look at myself in the mirror, and it's not pretty two days after Christmas, but let's look at myself in the mirror and... Am I against this? because it's against, they're for it, because it's against their guy. They don't like Trump. Am I against censorship only because it's against my guy, Trump? You know, I can point at the left and say, I thought you guys were for free speech. I thought you guys were all about 60s, freedom of expression. And now you're saying, fuck those who disagree. But then how can I say that when I'm saying company should be allowed to do whatever they want free speech do whatever the fuck you want and then they're censoring my guy so i'm i'm wrapping myself in the anti-censorship flag and i'm saying how dare you but you know if they were censoring antifa or fucking whoever would i be saying you know let's just be real how how much would i be coming out and saying if they are censoring aoc because they said that she is uh or um, Eon Omar, because, you know, let's say YouTube is far right, and they were saying uh, she's promoting, you know, she's she's promoting, um, the fuck is the word, Tech, techia, the, like, the, the tactical lying, like, pronounced or practiced in the Quran. Point being, is what if they said that she, or whatever, let's not even go into religion, let's just say it was AOC or Bernie Sanders, and they were like, these are, like, communist agents, and they were uh, and they banned them and they wrapped it up as hate speech would I would I be passively just thinking to myself like "Eh, it's probably not good but whatever fuck them 
would I be as passionately posting on social media that you can't do that, you can't do that because first it's them and then it's us. I'd probably be, I would probably be quiet. I would probably be quiet. Not like actively like I'm going to shut my mouth. I mean like I would be quiet in that like when I'm sleeping, I'm not trying to be quiet. I'm j- I just happen to be quiet. I would just, I would probably, it would, I just wouldn't give a fuck, right? I'd just be like, eh. And then if someone brought that up to me, would I just jump behind their, their private company? They can do whatever they want. But because it's against Trump, I'm standing in front of the, you can't censor. I do think censorship is objectively bad, but if they're not allowed to censor, then what am I for? Because what is right censorship normally related to like right government force or government power? But if they aren't allowed to censor, who would do that? That would be the U.S. government stepping in and saying you can't censor. But then now that's the U.S. government coming in and telling a private company what to do. That's the same like infringement of like freedom that I'm arguing against. No one should be able to censor because that's a big power telling a little power what they can and can't do. But if the U.S. government comes in and says, you can't censor, that's a big power telling the smaller power what they can and can't do. Am I just a hypocrite? Am I just a fucking... Do I not actually have any cemented foundational views? Is it just like a Super Mario level? Am I just jumping from platform to platform? Stance to stance to promote my argument and my beliefs and my beliefs now in five years i might be far left five years ago i was five far left and before the five years before that i was far right and five years before that i was far left is this just where i am right now in five years am i going to be saying you know it is hate speech or more ironically are the people on the left saying they're a private company (laughs) is Is that just the joke of it all? That now the far left is advocating for private businesses to be able to do what they want, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. And and now the far right. Man, that's a weird fucking conspiracy though, right? That's what Alex Jones said on his second appearance on Rogan was that he goes further into it and he says that Trump is actually a deep state actor. He's part of the Uniparty. But traditionally, the right was like okay with censorship. They're okay with the government stepping in and saying like, oh, that's too much nudity or that's inappropriate. Whereas the left was like, tie yourself in front of a, you know, tie yourself to the front of the bus or something like everyone's allowed to have free speech. And so they played a card of like, what if we put someone like so reprehensible like Donald Trump in? You would then have like, we've already, the right is already, we, they've shown they're okay with like government censorship how do we get the left right it's kind of like organic chemistry like like extraction how you have to change the states of matter and use different things with different affinities and boiling points so that you can take this seemingly homogenous mixture and extract different things from it not just like putting marbles in water and taking the marbles out but like taking a it would be like taking lemonade and somehow like getting the lemon and the water which like you can do with organic chemistry that's the that's the beauty of science <sighs> are the elite using trump as a form of uh organic chemistry extraction solvents and solute solutes but as like a social solvent and social solute are they using him to extract um you know it's like when you like vaporize a liquid but and then you you put it in like a distillation chamber and if i'm recalling correctly and then you like turn down the temperature to where you know only part of the substance within that vapor is going to liquefy whereas the other one has a higher boiling point or low whatever the fuck it is and how you extract is is that is that what they're doing are they shifting it so that you get the far left the freedom fighters the freedom of expression free love you know turn on tune in drop out 
and then um, and you're now getting them to be for censorship. This post about election fraud is disputed. Uh, this person has been banned for violating terms of service. Uh, this is inappropriate content. Episode 288 of TPC has been banned for inappropriate content. Um, but they only banned the HD version. I just happen to upload, every once in a while, I'll upload two versions of a podcast because the Zoom file is a lot smaller. It's like an hour long conversation on Zoom is like maybe 400 megabytes. An hour long conversation that I upload from like the screen recording, which is higher resolution, eight, nine gigabytes. So I mean, it's an 18 fold difference. Let's say 500 megabytes to, let's say 500 megabytes to 10 gigabytes. That's about the average exchange. So it's a 20 fold difference in file size, 20 fold difference in upload time, 20 fold difference in processing time. So when I do a podcast that I get really excited about, like when I did it with Mike Durant or I did it with Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, um, Charlie Duke was different. I got really excited, but I wanted it to be the best thing. When I do them with like Don the Pleb, Dale Comstock, and Joe Teddy, when I do uh, the the sort of four horsemen pod, uh, the podcast, or someone commented the other day and it made me laugh. I normally sh- throw those up from the Zoom file because I just get excited and I want. It. And those are normally super like time sensitive. Those are topical. But the audio on my end is admittedly shit, and I don't know why. The audio with everyone else comes to great, but for whatever reason audio through zoom on my macbook it just comes through like comes through like charlie brown so when i do those i'll upload an hd version which is the normal version when when it has in brackets hd what that actually is is all the episodes are hd high quality high, high definition video high definition high fidelity audio so it shouldn't be that I put brackets and say HD upload so much as like the handful of Zoom files I upload should say in brackets SD, standard uh, standard definition or standard fidelity. Point being is weird because they, they banned the 288 HD, which is the normal file, but they didn't ban the SD, which I can only, to me, all that says to me is that I don't think it was a flag. I don't think someone actively reported it. Maybe they did. I don't give a shit. Fuck you, you pussy. I think that... I think it must have been transcription. When they... they tra- Obviously, they transcribe it so you can do closed captions. I think it was transcribed and then, like... They do that. They they transcribe your video and then they, they don't have someone sit down and watch it. They can't do that. There's thousands of hours uploaded every, like, minute or something. <sighs> They, uh, so they transcribe it and then they can just, well, then you just take the text and you can just run that through whatever AI they use. That just means to me that <laughs> the audio of the, the normal file was so, was so shitty that it just didn't pick up on it. It's kind of like Terrence McKenna and Terrence McKenna. Yeah. Terrence. Yeah. It was Terrence McKenna. Don't talking about like psychedelic gatherings. He was like, don't get too big. Um, don't get too big and and use big or keep it small but use big words the problem with timothy leary is he said turn on tune in drop out right problem with uh, with woodstock was that it was this seismic cultural event you're supposed to he was like keep it small coffee houses if you go back to terence mccann's lectures they're all at like university libraries 100 people tops keep it small You've got to keep it small and use big words. It's the acquiescence of the cultural metamorphosis. We are the plant people. Sort of fly under the radar. He was like, don't stick your head above the parapet. Terrence McKenna was interesting because he didn't want the... He was he was for the abolition of like the powers that be and the greater structure. But he was... At the same time, he was all about like... Keep your head down. Which is, it's, you know, who's right in that situation? If you're in a concentration camp, do you say, we got to take out Hitler? Or are you looking at the reality of, like, you're watching your friends work to death and you've had, in the last three days, you've had 
you know, four ounces of dirty water and half of a piece of crust for nutrition, are you, you know, are you becoming a brutal realist and just going, keep my head down, work. One day I'll get out when the war will end and either I'll be executed or I'll be liberated. You know, we'd all like to sit around and say, I would have stood up to the guards. And then everyone clapped. You'd probably keep your head down. Right? I mean, I mean, the government bailed out corporations to the tune of like $11 trillion in 2008. Who, who stood up? I got work, I got kids, I got, you know, family. It's Terrence McKenna was weird in that fashion though, because he wanted maybe he was just a realist. He was like, Yeah, I want the fascist system overthrown, but not me. I mean, being brutally real. Was he wrong? And then you can get into the argument of like, you know, you're here once, like go into the halls of Valhalla. Like, fight the demon, fight the monster. Ar Arjunas, who is it? Ar Arjunas in the Bhagavad Gita. Rise to the fight. You are here to fight. Don't go skulking into the forest. Like, win or lose, you are to... Win or lose, you win. Because if you go onto the battlefield and die, you've still won. Or... Flip side. I'm only here once. Why not just go off into the woods, build a treehouse, smoke pot, and hang out with turtles and koalas and shit? I mean, I think they're both valid points. There's an interesting similarity you can see with Terrence McKenna. Terrence McKenna went out and lived in Hawaii. He had this, this estate, not really estate, he had a house in Hawaii, surrounded by psychedelic mushrooms on top of this huge hill, all private. He had internet. He had like, I think he had like wireless internet or satellite internet in like the early 90s. Dude was fucking, dude was pioneering. I mean, he kind of did the thing. He said, fuck it and moved out onto a hill in paradise, surrounded by psychedelic mushrooms and pot, watched the golden sun set over the ocean every day, looked at the galaxy, tinkered around with this this new this new global brain being laid out. I think he had a girlfriend. Died of brain cancer. Maybe that's the way to go. I mean, Ram Dass, Richard Alpert, rest in peace, died like a year and one week ago. I mean, his whole story, I'll post that in the link in the description as well. I need to make a note of how many things I need to post. Project 8200 and, um, and uh, Ram Dass' story. And uh, do Terrence McKenna keep it small they uh yeah he um i gotta go to the bathroom real quick sorry not sorry 38 38 minutes in okay yeah i'll edit that out But that's that's kind of a crazy one, right? <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'll edit. If it's just me, I guess I should edit out that bathroom break. That was like two minutes. Um, yeah, this it's kind of a weird fit one about right. There's that weird similarity between these the original woke guys, right? Terrence McKenna, Alan Watts. He ended up living on a houseboat in Sausalito, Sausalito, 
California. Right, big houseboat, just kind of did whatever. Walked around, wore like Japanese kimonos. There's also a raging alcoholic and apparently a horrible father, but Terrence McKenna ends up in Hawaii on a mountain in Parrot, I mean, the Garden of Eden, full band of Milky Way at night, psychedelics all around him, smoking pot, girlfriend, no kids, no pet. I mean, is there something to be said about that? I don't know. Ram Dass, Richard Alpert, no kids, no pet. He found out later in life he did have a kid. But I mean, he died last year, right? He was, uh, he went to Harvard. He was a Harvard um, uh, psychologist, behavioral psychologist. Good buddies with Timothy Leary. He went out, yeah, right. And then he, he did did psilocybin, and then did LSD, and he did that for a couple of years. Got fired, and then uh, went to uh, India to the Himalayas. I'm gonna listen to that lecture later. That's a fantastic lecture. Yeah, I'm gonna listen to that. The one that begins with. Uh, the geese have no intention of relieving of leaving the reflection on the water. The water has no mind to reflect it. It just is. But he went out to Hawaii in his like last decade of life. He was like in his nineties. But he went to the Himalayas, kind of like became enlightened. Went to Nepal for like twenty years. Worked providing like raising money for like these sort of in the field kind of third world country like quick eye surgeries for like cataracts or something. basically give these old farmers back their sight he ended up affecting like two million people in Nepal and then he went on his sort of like lecture circuit around the US you know San Francisco very he was right in the Ramdas Ramdas and Timothy Leary like might have been responsible for the 60s which is the most insane thing ever you know, did you hear about so and so that they threw a dope party? Like they might have been responsible for the sixties. That's insane. Um But yeah. So they they all so any but he ended up in Hawaii for his like last ten years. Duncan Trussell went out and met him. You could just go hang out with him. You apparently you could just set up a Skype call with him. No money, no nothing, no... He didn't broadcast it. It wasn't like he was getting content out of it like I am. Apparently, you could just set up a Skype call and fucking chat with Ram Dass. It's a tragedy. I didn't get him on here. In my egotistical, earthy mind. It's like, here's a chance to talk to this, like, living saint. And I'm like, oh, that'd be great content. I bet that would really drive the impressions up. I bet I would get on a lot of phones. <laughs> you know, like, share, and subscribe. You know, all you ethereal fourth dimension beings, people of light and potentiation, <laughs> make sure you put on that notification bell. Right. There's something to be said for that, though. Like, it, why does it seem like they all end up in Hawaii? All oh, Terrence McKenna and Ram Dass, Alan Watts and Salsalito, Hunter S. Thompson's kind of a guy that went off and and did it. You know, he had his own he had his own fucking place out in the country, a ton of land, and he would just shoot shit all day, LSD and cocaine and drinking and smoking and take Halsey on at the end of the night or the morning. He'd go to bed at like six. He also committed suicide. He and Watts, I'm not so sure about. I don't really look at them as goals. Hunter S. Thompson, I absolutely don't look at it as a goal. I mean, a crazy guy. Interesting. You know, it's like, yeah. Like, crazy people on a sidewalk. Like, sure, I'd watch a live stream with them, but I don't want to be near them. Like, Hunter S. Thompson, sure, great writing, but I don't want to be that. Alan Watts, very far out groovy lectures 
I don't want to be that raging alcoholic every day going through fucking delirium tr delirium tremens whatever it is I shouldn't know that um yeah I don't want to do that it seems miserable <sighs> Terrence McKenna Ramdas though they both I don't really see too many downsides with them I mean Terrence McKenna died of brain cancer he had a brain tumor which he laughed about because it was in the shape of a mushroom Ramdas had a stroke in I think 98 99 he was hilarious about it. He said I was stroked by God. God just stroked my face. And of course, Ram Dass just only found the upside in it. It was like, good, now I'm, you know, now that I'm limited in like my physical activities, that just means I can go farther inward. Um, I need to flip this flag sideways so it covers the whole background because this looks shitty. Um, but yeah. That is kind of crazy. I don't know how I got there. I don't really care either. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's like the philosophical argument though, right? Is it... Do you stand and fight? Do you fight the whatever? Fight Donald Trump? Because, you know, he's... You think you... You think he's evil? Is it fight Joe Biden because you think, I think, the election was stolen because I watched it a lot. But, hey, you think he, Trump is evil, I think, but whatever. Do you stand and fight what you admittedly perceive to be evil? And for good reason. I mean, whether you're fighting Trump or I'm fighting Biden, like, I think we're all doing it for, like, we would probably agree on the reasons, right? A more fair and just world and an honorable society and a better place for our offspring. Like, we're on the same page there. Or do you just go out into paradise? I'm so torn on that. I think the, I think the move is I think you stay and fight and then fantasize about paradise but don't actually go because what happens when you go and it's like not that great then what where, did, where else do you go you know is that is it kind of like into the wild right do you go out there stay in a bus eat berries and then realize that happiness is only real when shared and then when you attempt to come back, you you know, you're too weak and you die. They airlifted that bus out of Alaska. It's like a CH forty seven or something. Like I I first wanted to live in Hawaii. I remember meditating. It was one of the first times I meditated, and it was like um fall two thousand eight, maybe maybe like spring two thousand nine. And yeah, I thought that was like the move go out there find like peace and love but I'm now looking at it more and it maybe it, it just sounds like it would be good because like you know like right now like I'm, I'm getting paid to do a podcast I'm getting paid enough that like I can move out this summer I don't have kids I don't have pets I don't have debts I don't have a boss I can do whatever I want and like it's fucking awesome but at the same time it's not like full and I think that might be a very important distinction is that it's kind of like money doesn't buy happiness and I'm kind of seeing that now like it it's like It's like turning off the cold water will stop making you cold. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's turning on the hot water. Or if, you know, with the, about bad habits, like the first thing to do when you found yourself in a hole is to stop digging. Like stop digging, but that's, that's only part of it. The next is you got to get a ladder and get out. Like, I don't have to go work at a shitty liquor store. 
loved the people I worked with. But I mean, I mean, it's your minimum wage job, and you're dealing with you know fucking people buying boxes of wine at nine a.m. on a Tuesday. Like it's not. It's it's you were getting money and nothing more. Like remove that. I can wake up whenever I want, exercise, meditate. I can have on any guest I want. Today, I just wanted to do a solo podcast. But it's not, you know, it's not that same um, having a couple beers with your buddies on a Friday, just laughing at stupid shit, you know, a little racism, a little misogyny, maybe a couple genocide jokes, you know. You know, it's where you and your girls hanging out and, you know, talking about some guy's dick. Because apparently that's all girls talk about. It shows how mature I am. But there's nothing like that. You know, I think that maybe that's accurate. Happiness is only real when shared. Because, like, this is, this is fucking great. I am my own boss. I wake up when I want. I do what I want. I talk to who I want. Or just myself. No one dictates. No one curates. YouTube starts moving some of my content. Whatever. I just upload to another platform. It is freedom. But there are still like. You know. There's no. There's not that fulfillment of a romantic relationship. There's not that. Um. That relief of laughing to your blue in the face with some friends playing Halo 1 on a 360. Getting no scoped with the Scorpion tank across the map on Blood Gulch. Like, or is this just, is this just like the winter blues talking? This is just coronavirus depression because it's no one can go outside. So I think like going to Hawaii, I think that's like great on paper or wherever your bliss is. You want to go, you know, those like magical pictures, those like little like winter wonderlands in like the Nordic countries or wherever, you know, the Caribbean or Colombia or whatever, you know, whatever's your, your bliss. I think that's good on paper. But I think when you when you go out there, is, is is it everything? And I don't think so. You know, it was the feeling I got. The feeling I had when I got into med school. Or sorry, the feeling I had when I took the MCAT. I had already sent in all my applications. I'd got my letters of recommendation. I had done my shadowing. I had done my volunteering at hospitals. I had done my toxicology research I had done this that and the other thing and I took the MCAT and I knew I aced it even though the, I didn't get the test for a month I knew I aced it I just walked out of there and was like that's done I did that and I remember coming back to like an empty apartment this was uh, this was May 30th, May 30th, 2013. I think my roommate Chris was still there. But everyone else was, everyone had graduated like three weeks prior. I had an extra semester to go. But it was like skeleton, kind of like the Mount Perdido alien bases. It was skeleton crew. It was summer in Athens. Got some people taking courses, not much. And it was kind of empty. And I remember coming back and I was like, that was four years of working. And it was going to be so great when I finally got in. You know, studying over Thanksgiving. Taking Christmas Day off and that was it. And studying the rest. Not going on spring break, senior year. And just studying. And I've, if, for everyone that thinks that this is some profound moment, it's not. I've already beat this to death in my mind, not stopped for seven years. It's 
and then you know if I, if I didn't get in and I didn't ace it would I always be wondering is that what it is that's it I think I just I think I might have just stumbled on something did I have to work to get in to know that I could and know that I did and then walk away and pursue something else versus if I didn't get in and I didn't go to med school which is no different than my life now because I got in and didn't go but if regardless I didn't get in either or I don't go would that be years and years of um, looking back and thinking what if I had got in what if I had got in what if I had got in? This would all be different. I would have something to do instead of, you know, moping around about my brother for several years. Is it, for any new listeners, I lost my brother to suicide right after I graduated. Would I be doing that? Would I be blaming everything on that? I didn't find, you know, my relationship failed because I wasn't a doctor. What, versus now, it's like I got in and all those things happened. But I, by getting in and choosing not to go, I didn't have that you know what's behind door number three it's like i didn't have that that veiled silhouette that uh the ultimate scapegoat uh, if, if i had got into med school if i had just because then you can just waste all of your time scolding yourself for why didn't i work why didn't i study harder why didn't i have the discipline it, things will be different and then you raise a kid and say you're gonna get into med school but I sort of removed that from myself. I kind of took that cane away, right? It's you're, you're hobbling around with a, like a boot on your foot and it's like, yo, dude, you broke your foot a year and a half ago. Like, no, n no more. By getting in and not going, like I can't lean on that. Is that what this is? Like I am now free to go anywhere I could if I wanted to I could take the money I'm making from this podcast and I could go move out into an apartment in Hawaii no kids no pet no partner no nothing but I gotta be honest now that I can do it it doesn't sound too appealing which is weird as shit but it sounds pretty empty feel like I don't want to do it and maybe that's it maybe by maybe this is just a repeat of med school I have stolen that crutch from myself now is that some higher self some more enlightened part of my brain you know the self behind the self the witness not the puppet the I the Brahman the Atman the pot Atman. Am I removing those crutches for myself so that I can't lean on them? And thus I either have to stand tall or I have to fall through air and hit my elbow on the ground, metaphorically. Is that it? By sort of unlocking the game, I'm not tied down. I can go anywhere. Now that I can, I don't really want to. And I don't think it's just a case of like, now that I have it, I don't want it. You know, like the guy, you know, trying to fuck the girl. When you know, once you hit it, you're like, eh. I don't think it's that because as soon as you can't get it anymore, now you're, no, I want it again. I think it's knowing I could. I think for me, it's like that piece I had, like I never have once regretted not going to med school. And I don't think that would be the case at all. I think my story would be so different had I not gotten in. I would always go back to, what if I had just done it? What if I had just worked harder? More discipline, why don't I take another shot at it? I'm only 30, I can still go to med. I think it would be that, but by getting in and choosing not to go, I've stolen that excuse from myself. I think that's what this is. You're free now. 
gonna move out of my parents. I had to put my dog down this year. You're free. You don't have kids. You don't have a property you need to sell. You got a Honda Civic, and I mean, I got podcast equipment. But aside from that, I've got a couple duffel bags of clothes. You're free. Where do you go? What do you do? I think if I had gotten married and had kids, even and let's say I'd gone to med school. Well, one, if I'd gone to med school, I'd probably be spending off my time wondering what if I didn't go to uh, what if I didn't go to med school? What if I had just taken the leap into the void and tried to make a living doing something I liked, loved, not liked? But now I'm in that reality where I, I got in, I did, I got everything I wanted. I got in and I didn't go, so I could turn it down instead of having it turned down me. I took the void. I took, I grabbed my balls and jumped into the void. I did the thing. I went for it. Not only do you have to have, you know, how many people have the balls to go for it. And then of those who do go for it, how many people succeed? It's like, I, I got into that percentile. You know, how many people can say they have what I have now? But now that I have it, maybe it's, I just want something. Maybe I want something that doesn't require years and years of grinding. Maybe I just want like a simple human comfort, a cozy home, a fuzzy cat, a big dog, a girlfriend, a big yard where I can have a bonfire. Is that what it is? And I think it is. And I don't see it being filled with regret because like med school, it's not, what if I just gone for it? Just gone out and done whatever I wanted to do. No, it's like, it, instead of wondering, what if I just gone for it? Just moved to New York, moved to Hawaii, solo bachelor. <sighs> well, no, because I now have that opportunity and I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it at all. I want something real. I want a relationship, I want friends, I want to laugh, go to a stupid movie, go to a restaurant and then bitch about how much it sucked. And I think I will enjoy it a lot more because I turned down med school. I turned down the solo digital nomad lifestyle. It's not that I got rejected. It's that I was able to do it. And then I said, no, apparently that just seems to be my fetish grinding for the gold medal and then smacking it out of the person's hand when they're trying to put it around my neck. Apparently that's just what I do. Got in a med school, 15,000 applied, a hundred got in. I don't want it. Take it. Right. <laughs> I got it. You know, I made it. I got an investor. I've got a full salary on this or will you can do whatever i want you can go fucking live in london you go live in berlin you go live in <sighs> i don't really want it i think i just want like a girlfriend and like a house yeah like it you know video games are video games are fun like chewing gum is fun like you're not gonna find the answers to life in a packet of bubblicious, but god damn it, for 30 seconds, that that grape tastes great. Blow a big bubble and then spit it out. I'm sure you can keep going back for pieces, but like, that's not, you know, holiday eating. Today's the 27th, December 27th, 2020. Holiday eating, like, I'm gonna eat so much pie and ham and casserole, and, and I did, and it was fucking great. But you never reach a point where you're like, there it is. I did it. That That's fulfilling. It's fun. It's enjoyable. Go to sleep, take naps, lazy Christmas. But it's not, you never get, you never scratch the itch entirely. You leave it a little bit, but it's, 
you know, it's like a shower. You get in a tot, and then you know when you turn it up a little bit after a couple of minutes, and you're oh, you know that. Eventually, you have to turn it up again. But even when you do, it's not the same effect. You're just chasing the dragon. Are, you, are we just? Am I just chasing a dragon? What are the per? Was it purple elephant, purple dragon? I don't know. I never did heroin. Randy Marsh. Oh, 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 oh. You know, what is, where is fulfillment found? I don't think it's, I think the idea sounds great. No wife, no kids, no, I just got a fucking penthouse in Honolulu. I, I have a Lamborghini, I have a jet, I can go anywhere. I mean, ultimately it will just be where I am now. It will be another peak, another mountain peak I scaled. And you'll get up there. And then, as now, and as was acing the MCAT, you're sitting there single, alone, having not spent enough time with friends, thinking that you were going to find Nirvana or Shangri-La at the end of a pursuit there's no gold at the end of the rainbow and that's that's not to say that that's depressing that's not to say it's all nothing you know blow your brains out no 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 it's it's like when you're t you taking directions to a place and even though you're in a city you've never been in before sometimes you just have that gut feeling where you're like this isn't the right way like, I know the, you know, it's like Dumb and Dumber. <sighs> I thought the Rocky Mountains would be a little rockier. <laughs> like, you know, it's sometimes, and that doesn't mean that, like, the trip's fucked. Go and totally redeem yourself. <sighs> it's not that. It's just, you know, turn around. You know, into the wild. You know, happiness is only real when shared. Unfortunately, he was too weak to go, and he died in the in the bus. Is that I think that's where I am right now is it doesn't mean it's fucked it doesn't mean it's all over you know go take some pills try to find happiness and some synthetic heroin no not at all but it does mean that like um it's like playing a video game you're trying to find the edge of the map so you just fly out into the ocean and you keep looking at like the re the reverse view and you see the map slowly disappearing behind you. You're like, oh, I'm really going. And then eventually it disappears entirely. And then it kind of starts tricking you because once it no longer has to, once it no longer is, I guess, obligated to render the city in the background, it just starts like a treadmill. It just kind of starts synthesizing the same water underneath you. You can go out for hours, and, and then you're like, okay. Is that what it is? I kind of feel like that's where I'm standing. It's like I've followed the rainbow farther than anyone. I think I saw med school at the end of the rainbow. And as I got towards the end, and I saw the rainbow dissolving into just a forest... I saw a bigger, brighter rainbow of making money doing something I like. And now I've reached that rainbow and I'm seeing a bigger, brighter rainbow. Go get a mansion in some tropical paradise. I'm not buying it anymore. There's no end to the rainbow. So find someone to look at the rainbow with. Or don't. If it goes somewhere where there's no rainbows. I 
this is going to sound like a really douchey thing. But like I don't like I don't really know who to go to for advice on any of this. You know, med school you can go to doctors or or former students who got in. People who got in but didn't go that it gets a lot smaller. But you can still find them. I didn't, but I imagine you still could. I found doctors who obviously were doctors, but told me if I wasn't feeling it, then it's not for me. But how many of them went out to try to make money having no boss, doing whatever the fuck they want, saying whatever the fuck they want, dicks, titties, retard, faggot, butt fuck a goldfish, and make money without a boss and no one having input? Like how many have, not a whole lot. So there's really no one to lean to. There's no one to find advice from. Who the fuck? Which is terrifying, because now I now I actually have to formulate my own opinions, <laughs> and and be an original person. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm incredibly proud that I did this. And I definitely would not trade it for the world because I'm, I mean, I'd do whatever the fuck I want. And the second that was taken from me, I would realize how much I enjoyed it. So I, I'm not forgetting how great this is. I am grateful for this. Maybe it's not that ecstatic bliss of finding out the podcast is getting funded, but there is a pretty awesome baseline. There's a pretty awesome baseline buzz. You know, it's like, how do you follow 2020? Like, you gotta have an alien invasion, right? You gotta have World War Three. <sighs> 220? I don't know, maybe wrap this one up. Sure, let's wrap this one up. <laughs> Uh, go subscribe on BitChute and Rumble. Those will be in the description and sticking to the top comment. Um, if you have any ideas for guests, please link them or, or just post. I don't give a fuck. Just comment them. I don't give a shit. Or if you want them to contact me directly, have them email me at Tommy's Podcast, T O M M Y S P O D C A S T at gmail.com or at Proton Mail. Yeah. And, um, Hope everybody has a good one. Thanks for tuning in, bitches. And, um... I feel better. I feel like I just had a little self-therapy. Happiness is only real when shared.